It is a pleasure for us to introduce Cristina Diaz Gonzalez, July 31st, 2010, in Pasadena, California. This is part one, which is mainly videos and a few pictures. Please make sure you see part two. Before taking time out of your busy schedule to come here tonight and support Romans and independent bookstores, it really means a lot to us. This evening we are so fortunate to have author Cristina Diaz Gonzalez with us to discuss her historical novel, The Red Umbrella. Ms. Gonzalez grew up in a family that instilled great pride in her Cuban heritage. She lived in a small southern town and then moved to Miami when she was 14. As a young child, she loved both playing with her friends as well as reading in her treehouse in a dogwood tree. It was at this time that her dream to be a writer was born. After high school, she attended the University of Miami and graduated with a degree in accounting. After college, she went to law school at Florida State University. After several years of practicing law, Christina Gonzalez returned to her childhood dream of becoming a writer. Her first book has received rave reviews. One reviewer said, I truly fell in love with, Lu with Lucia, experiencing all of the ups and downs of her life, both in Cuba and as a refugee in the United States. Whether my heart was breaking for her or overjoyed by her successes, I enjoyed every minute of this wonderfully emotional novel. Please help me welcome an author who writes about something every American needs to know about, in a way that truly touches everyone's heart. Christina Gonzalez. <laughs> and thank you to all of you. It's, wow, it's an amazing crowd, um, a little unexpected, as you might have noticed uh, with uh, some problems with the uh, quantity of the books, but they are actively working on it right now. So hopefully by the time I'm done talking, that will all be squared away. So. First of all, again, thank you all uh, for coming out here tonight. I feel like you already know my life story. She did such a good job of, you know, telling you all about me. And I think she took a little bit of what I was going to tell you about. Um, but what she said was true. I am very proud of my Cuban heritage, and I'm very thankful um, to my parents for instilling that in me. I did grow up in a very small southern town where... We were pretty much, when I was born, the only Hispanics in town. But even though that was the case, and we had to drive an hour to go to a fast food restaurant because McDonald's didn't come to Perry, Florida until I was 10 years old, um, my parents made sure that not only was I knowledgeable about my Cuban roots, but that I also spoke Spanish, that I was both bilingual and bicultural. Um, as much as they were appreciative of the United States and the opportunities given to them. They were also very proud of where they came from, and they wanted me and my sister to know that. And it's something that I've tried to pass on to my own children. So, you know, it's la herencia that they gave to me and that I'm trying to pass on it, that same tradition. So, do the red umbrella. And so for some of you, I know many of you are more than familiar with the story. You lived the story. But some of the rest of you may not even know really what the story is about. So The Red Umbrella is a historical fiction novel, which means it's based on very real events, but the story itself is fictional. It's the characters I made, most of them, except for one, are all made up. And it's the story of a 14-year-old girl, Lucia, who lives in Cuba in 1961, and that's already two years after the revolution. But like a typical teen, She's not really concerned about the revolution. It hasn't hit home. What she's concerned about is the cute boy that sits in front of her in algebra class, about going to parties, planning her quinces, about going to the movies with her best friend. That's what her life revolves around. And it's not until the soldiers come into her small town and she starts seeing some of the freedoms that she used to take for granted being taken away. She notices people that she knew disappearing, being hurt, and finally she knows that her fa own family is now being watched. And slowly that realization comes to her. All the while, 
her parents already knew. The same parents that she thought were so uncool and that just didn't, like any typical teen, just don't understand her at the beginning. They knew a lot more than she gave them credit for. So by the time her eyes are open, her parents are already having to make an incredibly difficult decision. And that decision is that the only way to protect them, her and her little brother, is to send them away. Because at the time, during Castro's revolution, many kids were already being sent to the Soviet Union, whether or not their parents liked it, if they showed any promise for athletics or um, any type of proficiency in any of the arts or sciences, they were already being sent away on scholarships. The rest were being sent out in brigades to teach um, people out in the countryside um, to read or write or cut sugar cane. And parents were fearful that they were losing complete control of their children, and so they had to make this decision. So all of a sudden, Lucia finds herself being sent away, within 24 hours she's told she's going to go live in another country, and then she finds herself in the U.S., her and her little brother. They're put into a camp where many of these kids were housed, and then sent on to a foster family. And in this case, it was in Nebraska. And so the rest of the story takes place in Nebraska, her not knowing if, her, if she'll ever see her country, her family, her friends again. And so that's the fictional story of the Red Umbrella. And the reason it's historical fiction is because it's based on the very real events, which I already alluded to, of Operation Pedro Van. And that was when 14,000 children, over 14,000 children, were sent to the U.S. under those same conditions. And many people can't believe that so many kids came over. And it was in a two-year period, from 1960 to 1962. And they, that doesn't even consider all the other children who came over with relatives. These were children coming on a plane completely by themselves. Now about half of them were picked up at the airport by family members or friends of the family. And in my case, my parents were some of those kids. They didn't know each other in Cuba. They came over as 15-year-olds um, with their younger siblings. But they were fortunate. They had someone who picked them up at the airport. They knew either it was a family member or a friend of the family who went to the airport and picked them up and housed them until my grandparents <coughs> were able to come over to the U.S. Now, my mother-in-law was also one of these children. She came over at 16, and she had no one. She went to those camps, and those camps were not summer camps. They were more like army barracks, and that's how I, I try to describe them to young children. You know, all these children being housed there, sometimes it would be for a week or a month for three months until a foster family could be found. And sometimes people say, oh, you chose Nebraska to make it dramatic, to make it go from Cuba to the Midwest. You know, how could you get more opposite? And the fact is, many, many children were sent to Nebraska, to Iowa, to Oregon, to California. And it wasn't, it's not me using dramatic license, it's my being accurate. My own mother-in-law was sent to Des Moines, Iowa, to a foster family there that, you know, she, she didn't know them. In a, so now you're not only in a foreign country, you're completely foreign, even climate-wise, going from a tropical island to all of a sudden these harsh winters. So imagine being all this upheaval, and you're a teenager, or even younger. You might have been, you know, seven, six, five years old. So those are the real events that this story was based upon. And for me, it's with great pride. Um, it's just, it fills me with such orgullo that I can say this story that really hadn't been on a national level <coughs> yet, especially for the next generation. And so, you know, and I give great credit to the people who actually lived through it and are now, you know, coming out and voicing and telling them, them, telling everyone of their own experiences. So, with all that being said, um, I think what I'll do is I will read a brief passage from the book. There, I do have a film agent uh, because some people have expressed interest.
um, I have a literary agent, and after her, you know, she's been she's now representing me. She didn't actually represent me when I sold the book, but there has been some interest. So now there's a film agent involved, and that's pretty much all I know. It could happen. It might happen one day. I, you know, there's some authors who, you know, will tell you, oh no, I do not want my book. This is the end of part one. Please make sure you watch part two. Thank you.